Our sponsor this month is Published, an affiliate of Village Voices. Published offers all author services from writing tips, critiques, manuscript evaluations, and editing, as well as tips to help you become published. If you prefer to self-publish, purchase the step-by-step book on publishing through Amazon, or purchase services a la carte, from formatting to creating custom covers or even tips to gather endorsements. The staff is headed by two professional writers. After your books are published, either trade paper, electronically, or both, purchase marketing tips, web services, book trailers, or turn your book into an audiobook. Publish provides all your writing, publishing, and marketing needs. So give them a call at 941-748-6865. Contact them online at dgould 497 at AOL.com or go to the website at www.publishedavillagevoices.webs.com. Culture Coast. The intro you just heard was by Al Musitano, and today we are interviewing author, editor, publisher, and more, Jeffrey Orenstein. He is going to be discussing his recently published book, as well as one he's working on now and seven before that. And please excuse my hoarseness, my voice is still coming and going. Hi, Jeffrey. Welcome Hi. to Culture Coast. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Now, you uh, started your writing life Tell us a little bit about how young you were when you first realized you wanted to write. I was either 10 or 11, and I I can't remember which one, but I started my own little neighborhood newspaper. Uh, Was this for your friends or for... for, I I went door to door and said, would you like to subscribe to the neighborhood news for a penny? (laughs) I dictated it to my mother, who typed it up for me. Uh, This was pre-computer days. Did you staple it together? Yes, we did. <laughs> so it was a multi-page newspaper? Yeah, two or three pages, I think. And what kind of stories were you writing at that point? Uh, I wrote profiles of some of the people in the neighborhood. I wrote some news about, at, the, at that time, there was a suburban railroad passenger station that passed through the community. I wrote news about the, that there were plans to close that station and things like that. I very, remember stories. Very interesting for 10 or 11. Yeah. That's... that's not just talking about the dog or the cat or no. the frogs. <laughs> a really interesting start. So then you go to high school. Did you become the editor of the paper? No, no. As a matter of fact, I didn't. Uh, what were your interests in high school? I was interested in cars and planes and girls. Well, yeah, that's typical of the girls. But the planes. Did you think about going in the service at all? Yeah, I thought about it. Uh, and then I decided it's not really for me. Uh, the life that you have to live to be a, a member of the military, fine for people who like that kind of life, but Very I was too structured. much of a too much of a, a freelancer and a, a free spirit. Okay, and you said uh, your parents were rather politically outspoken in, around the home, that you discussed things like that a lot. Yeah, they always talked about current events and what was going on nationally and internationally, and race was a big issue at the time constant discussions about those kinds of issues and I learned as a very young person that it's okay to discuss those things and I found it extraordinarily interesting. Did actually. you ever in high school or even later in college consider becoming a politician? Yes. <laughs> so it was it was a possible yeah, a matter direction of fact, to go? I, I ran for political office once upon a time. Oh cool, very cool. Excuse us just a moment, we'll be right back. And welcome back. Now, you're, you, it's a possibility that you might be a politician someday because of your family's interest in it. How about... And my parents were friends with a man who at that time was a state senator who went on to be a United States senator. Very cool. And he was a kind of role model for me. That's a great kind of role model. Now, so, so you're getting ready to go to college. What did you choose to major in? I majored in 
political science with a full intention of it becoming pre-law and going to law school. But I got so interested in it, I gave up law school even though I applied and was accepted to, to law school. No, I decided to go to uh, graduate school and get a PhD in political science instead. Now, a lot of politicians are lawyers. Right. Did, were you also thinking of that when you were considering pre-law? Uh, probably not. I was thinking of earning a living and I have a big mouth and figuring that was a good way to use it. <laughs> so this is the turbul turbulent times of Martin Luther King and, oh, yeah. the, and the Vietnam War, things like that are starting to, to happen. So you go on and you get your PhD. Where was your first job? My first job was at a little place in Ohio that at that time was relatively unknown called Kent State University. Uh, very quickly became known globally because the very that's of first course year. where the oh yeah where the the shootings happened. So your very first year, yeah. you were in the middle of the, one of yeah. the biggest political right. I was not messes we've ever had. There physically when it happened, uh, but you were working for them already. Yeah, I was already working for them, and then at, at the beginning of the next semester, there I was. That's a unbelievable way to start out your career in political science and teaching kids. So how what was the atmosphere on Kent State that following year? Were people for the Vietnam War, were they against the government, or was it was it just a whole stunned um yeah, a lot of like people, zombies? A lot of people were stunned, uh, and I don't blame them for, for what had gone on. The ironic thing is that Kent was a pretty uh, conservative college with a lot of uh, small town kids and farmers' children and so forth. It was 45 minutes from Cleveland, but it was out in the country. It and wasn't a political. No, no, it wasn't style political at all. I mean, I had just come from the University of Wisconsin, getting my master's and PhD, was, which was highly politicized. Um, they used to call it the People's Republic of Madison. <laughs> uh, and when I went to Kent, I figured, okay, now quietly, I'm, I'm going to find out what a quiet college is like for a while. Wrong. Uh, yeah, then all of a sudden you were at the center of the yeah, whole mess. and I stayed there for 25 years. And taught political science. Taught political um, science, became a full professor. The people who start to... Political... At Kent State, I'm trying to get a feel for what the atmosphere might have been like at that time with with this, with the people in um, shock, basically. The, the kids coming in, are they still going to be political science majors or... Or are they just no, backing away from that at this point? I, I don't think it had much effect on it. The, the biggest program at Kent at that particular time was education. We have a lot. We had a, a pretty good school in training high school and uh, elementary school teachers. I, I taught. My course was required for uh, education majors for the entire time, uh -huh. so I, I got very familiar. So with, there weren't a lot of political science. No, I mean there were some. We were one, we were kind of a middle-sized department in political science. The English department and the, and the education department were far bigger than we were. Yeah. All right. So now you graduate and you you're 25 years at Kent State. What else were you doing? Were you writing books at this point? Yes. Because as a professor, yeah. it's expected. Right. I was writing books and lots of scholarly papers, and I finally figured out what I considered a neat original idea, which turned out to be not original at all, but it was neat <laughs> anyway. Uh, and that is, as I was writing these various scholarly papers for the American Political Science Association annual meetings and so forth, I figured out what my next book was going to be, and each one became a chapter, which is now... Each one of the papers was yeah, a chapter. Right, and now as I blog, uh, I'm pretty much doing the same thing. I'm blogging my next book uh, on one of my websites. Which is a different different direction from your previous books, correct? Yes. Your current book that you're working on now is called Simply Simply Smart Travel. Yeah. So where, let, let's let's drop back just a little bit. Okay. These books that you've got written, they're, are they all on political science? Yeah, they're all on public policy. I wouldn't call them political science per se. Uh, three of them were in political philosophy, political morality, liberty and equality and justice and, and, and things like that. Uh, two of which were written by my, who's my PhD advisor, at the University of Wisconsin, and we collaborated. I guess we got along okay. <laughs> <laughs> we collaborated on a couple of uh, books that were published by Harper Collins and were actually pretty widely adopted in, in a lot of the Ivy League schools and on the West Coast. So, with 
I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but which way do you lean? Because you've got a lot of education and knowledge, so... Oh, well, I'm, you're not putting me on the spot. Okay. I'm a liberal Democrat and proud of it. Okay, in a very, very conservative Republican area. Yeah, but that's all right. <laughs> okay. I just, I'm an educator, too. Well, that, that, and I've noticed that most professors and educated people tend to be more left-leaning and trying to... That, that's it, an interesting misperception, actually. Is it? The American Political Science Association did a survey of its members uh, back in the late 60s, and the majority were not liberal. Uh, they were all over the place. Well, haven't we changed our perception of liberal and conservative a lot in the last 20 or 30 years? Oh, uh, liberalism, I, I won't even talk about conservatism for the moment, but liberalism has been evolving for two millennia. Uh, it, it comes from the root term liberty, and uh, many of the, the so-called libertarians are anything but <laughs> are liberal, actually, and, and don't know it uh, because they emphasize the value of liberty. To me, when I say liberal, uh, when I say liberal Democrat, I mean somebody who believes in liberty and freedom of opportunity and who believes in democracy, and that's what. That's what a liberal Democrat is. That has nothing to do with the big D Democrat yeah, party. Which well, is really just the same as the big R party. Right, exactly. They're both, they're both two sides of the same coin. It's yeah. ridiculous. Uh, it, we, we don't have a choice anymore. <laughs> it's, it's not, that's bad. So that brings me back to your last, your, your recent publication, okay. Fixing American Government. Right. Let's talk about this book where you have come up with some ideas that the entire country could take and possibly, possibly get us out of this spiral into a death, a death spiral as far as I think yeah. it goes on our political I don't kid myself, they're writing a, a, a book. A book will change the world. It's going to change the world, uh, and not even our little corner of the world, but you know, hopefully I can influence a few. It really, uh, as I mentioned, I taught education majors, and, and one of them, the required course was American government. Okay. And I used to have sections up to two or three hundred uh, in American government. And I gradually, over the years, over 25 years, uh, as I evolved the course, uh, I organized it around the question, which I announced on day one and said, by the way, this is going to be on your final, so you better learn how to answer this question. Uh, is the United States a democracy? And what, what, why does that matter? And this book, is 150 fixing some government. yeah fixing American government is 150 some pages an answer to that question. Um, we are not particularly a democratic country. We are partially democratic. Uh, we don't have general elections where the American public can go to the, the ballot box and change the government. We always because of separation of powers and the electoral college and and checks and balances. We always have two thirds of the Senate. That are not up, and the judicial system, uh, judiciary, the policy-making judiciary, read the Supreme Court, uh, is not elected, not responsive. They're appointed for life. The presidency has term limits, so as soon as we re-elect somebody, he immediately or she immediately becomes a lame duck. So there are lots of problems. Uh, the original Constitution um, was for white property males only to select a committee that would select a chief executive and they got to vote for their state uh, representatives and, and the House of Representatives. The Senate was appointed by the state legislature. The, the president was appointed by the Electoral College. <laughs> so that was really not a democracy yeah, we, at all. No, that was very undemocratic. We've had a partial democratic revolution. Now we've em enfranchised most adults. Um, Females and non-white people, are but are sometimes discriminated against, but but, but you could vote. Uh, and we have had an expansion by the direct election of, of the Senate. Uh, we've had an expansion of democratic elements, but we are not anywhere near democratic. Where we need to be, it's not right. one vote, one one. No. I know we voted to not have gerrymandering. How does it continue to happen? Uh, it's been outlawed for 
a long, long time, and we've passed constitu state constitutional amendments. It happened because the people in Tallahassee flipped a large bird to us. And well, said, it's not just us. It's, it's other states that right. have it. How do they get away with that when it's against the, the, the laws of... They get away with it by, by doing it. And, <laughs> and no, nobody takes them to court, as far as I'm concerned. And I said not so unfacetiously that gerrymandering ought to be a, an offense punishable by prison time in this country. That would maybe stop them from that nonsense? I would hope I, so. I, I look at our district, and there's like this little narrow channel right along the railroad tracks that, that goes from one city to the next city no, to the next I city. I know. It's outrageous. In a nutshell, uh, it's conventional wisdom to say today's crop of greedy and highly partisan politicians has caused gridlock, and if we elect good people, we'll get back to the American dream, but I don't think so. I think it's the system itself. Yes. I think, I think it's the I system totally that, agree. that encourages it's the election. It's a corrupt system, system now. Yeah. And that, it's, do you think that started with Citizens United or before? No, I think it started Wait, in 1787 at the Constitutional <laughs> Convention when a bunch of white elitists got together and said, how are we going to create something to get rid of the British but still keep ourselves in power? Yeah. All right. Citizens United was, is the latest outrage. That's just, I, I, I don't understand how we can ever get back the power for the people when... Right now, the corporations. No, it's not a matter of getting back the power of the people. It's getting it. We've never had it. Okay. From the very beginning, actually, we are moving in a liberal and democratic and empowering direction over the 228 year sweep of American history. We're better than we used to be. We started out pretty bad. Yeah, no women and no blacks and no any people of any color and. And people without property, and we could vote for almost nothing of significance. Okay, so how do we fix and make it a democracy? What can we do as, as common citizens? Well, maybe I'm naive, but I'm an educator. Okay. And one of the things that I think is really important is to talk about the issue and educate people uh, about the issue. I, I think we need to have comparative and analytical and thoughtful civics courses, which we don't have in this country. It's not even required in a lot of jurisdictions. And when they do teach it, it's usually somebody who is not an expert in the field, who may be a coach or a science teacher or something like this, who's doing it part-time. Do you think money and, and the, um, the, the money in elections themselves that, that really are supplied mostly by corporations, is that, I know it influences it, that's not the question, but is influence. there a way to get it out? Yes. We can, can we stop politicians from from getting money from all these places? Yes. And stop the financing of campaigning, a very simple, practical thing that's been done. In but many then they wouldn't have the billions they need to advertise. Oh, well, <laughs> I guess some TV station owners might be upset about that. I, and I think that's where the big block is. I would love to see the end to advertising on politics because when I've seen and I'm not talking about hearing them I'm and I'm not talking about taking away their voice but in my mind if we stop those 30 and 60 second ads and all the billboards that don't really give us anything about what the person stands for I don't care if they're Republican or Democrat what do they stand for what are they mm -hmm. going to do when they get there I was in England during one of their national elections not too terribly long ago, and I, I was there for a considerable period of time and watched it all on television and, and watched the English election unfold. Uh, and they have a quiet period when there's no political advertising for several weeks before the election, and the television stations uh, and the newspapers are, are by law required to give the candidates uh, space, and they had television debates. And, that is and in, so important. In a minimum of 15 minutes on, uh, slots. To tell people what they yeah. stand in for. In 15 minutes, you, you, you can't just have cliches and lies. You actually have to say Explain something or you stuff. look like an idiot. Thank you. That would be so wonderful if we could do something. Well, that's another thing. know we, what they stand yeah. for, not just, oh, well, he sucks. Look at how bad he is. Yeah. And, and he did this and she did that. It's terrible. So you asked me what we can do. Yes. We can create better citizens with better civic education, require it, uh, and make it truly 
analytical and comparative and thoughtful, and employ and fairly pay teachers who are certified experts in the field, not coaches, and I'm, I'm not against sports, by the way. I think coaches <laughs> serve a wonderful... Oh, yes, uh, but Americans do idolize their no. sports. But I, I think we need to ha require at least a bachelor's degree in the subject matter. Uh, we need to empower voters and make sure elections are fair. We need a new Voting Rights Act. Um, we have 50 states and 50 different electoral uh, sets of rules. I say abolish that and have, now, a, have national done, rules for a national election. Can it be done through 50 state amendments? Can can the pet people do it that way? Because yeah, the you, government, you know, the senators on the republic, the, yeah, on either side, they're not going to go for this. You could, but it, the but two party not, system no, is really part of no, the problem too. Yeah. Well, there's a, the reason for a two party system. It's the logic of having. Single member winner take all districts. If you have a certain district and you have to get 50% of the vote or 51% to win, obviously minority parties are not going to have any sway. So it, uh, it, it tends to gravitate toward two parties. If you had proportional representation, where if your party got 30% of the vote, you got 30% of the legislature, that it would That's be a different kind of system. That's the way they do it in England, too, isn't it? No. No, I saw that somewhere where they had. The, the, the it's not exactly are, how they do it in England. They negotiate after a, a, a parliamentary election. They form coalitions if one party doesn't get a majority. It comes out that way. Okay. And that, there are other uh, nations that actually have uh, proportional representation. and You can prevent all the minor parties from throwing a monkey wrench in the system by having a 5 or 10% threshold. If you can't get that, um, what time about to fight for another day. Anyways, we need yeah. to... We need to create a federal elections commission that works. Uh, <laughs> uh, what do you think of the new proposal that they're coming up with that everybody should be required to vote or it, it should be a mandatory uh, thing? To me, that doesn't. If they, me, don't, if they don't pay attention, they're it, still not paying it, it attention. It leaves me cold. I mean, I would think if there is a. The reason we have apathy is because people feel their vote doesn't count. You know what? It doesn't. They're generally right. It doesn't. I know. I've given so, up and I've tried to argue yeah. it with the political parties when they call me looking for my vote. And I'm like, why should I vote for you? I haven't given up. You're but, the same. <laughs> but, but there are times when I feel Apathetic. I should give up. Yeah. And uh, you're a political person, so yeah. imagine the layman who's but, uh, yeah. working for his job every day. If our votes count in and we saw consequences of elections and majorities in elections, voter participation, and we grow dramatically, and people who saw a stake in, in the process would tend to educate themselves more, just out of self-interest. Okay, so it's not going to happen all at once. Where do we start? Well, we start by getting money out of politics, by having better civic education, repealing Citizens United, enacting public financing of elections, getting rid of term limits. We already have term limits. It's called Say No. Uh, <laughs> I think because of the money in politics, people realized that they yeah. were just getting re-elected re by but the same people that were already owning them. Yeah, term limits is, is basically stop me from being myself. Don't don't let me be who uh, who I want I want to be. It's a stupid thing. What it does is it, it empowers. As, as soon as people begin to get some institutional memory, they're forced to leave, and it empowers their staffs. And staffs are not elected, and we have kind of a tyranny of. Uh, now, state legislative staffers. And that's on the state level we've got term limits. Right. We don't have them at the federal level Only except for the, for the presidency. And that, that was because the Republicans were upset that Roosevelt and got elected four times. So <laughs> yeah, if we'd had term it limits. It wasn't even that. The Republican and Democratic parties have both changed over the years oh, drastically. Yeah. Of course they I have. mean, the Republicans are the opposite of what they used to be. They're reflections of, of the, the contemporary system. And as, this, and as public opinion evolves, the parties evolve with it usually right behind it, not leading it. And now they both seem to have the same philosophy, except they fight in, in, when they go to the floor. But other than that, they seem to yeah, be the, very... The Democrats the are a little more concerned with the male distribution of, of income in this country. Uh, but you're right. Not, they're, they're, not, they're they, not dramatically. They, they seem to be all minions of the corporations mm -hmm. and Wall Street mm -hmm. and making sure that they're, the businesses are doing mm -hmm. well because that will make our economy do well. And all that does is make the, the, the stock market do well, not the actual economy yeah. of the people. I'm a, a firm believer in capitalism. I, th I think 
having the economy do well and having corporations do well is fine, but that doing but they well. They should be paying taxes yeah, on that. Right. Doing well does not mean owning the political system yes. and making the Thank rules. You. <laughs> and yet they do right, right now. It's like, what? Like, how can Comcast turn around and make the Senate and the and the and the the representatives re, renege on the FCC being in charge of the internet? Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. like, what? We just, we just, it took us years to get that to happen until it becomes a utility. And then they run around going, oh, it, it's the government running it. No, it's not. All they're doing is saying you businesses can't run it. That's all. <laughs> yeah, point well taken. You know, what we need to do, the bottom line, as far as I'm concerned, as a political scientist, is democracy does work. If you have a general election where you can elect the entire government or unelect the entire government and throw the bums out, uh, <laughs> the bums would be a lot more responsive to, to public opinion. So I think we need to create, gradually working toward creating a general election in this country, which means putting, getting rid of gerrymandering, outlawing money, the, the role of big money in politics, and having the entire government elected at once. All the senators elected at one time, all the representatives elected at one Clean time, house. and all of, and the executive elected at one time, and the Supreme Court, even though I happen to agree with the decisions they handed down recently uh, in the last few days, the Supreme Court, as far as I'm concerned, is a democratic obscenity because you have nine people appointed for life, and they're responsible to nobody but their, their own uh, views of, of what's right and wrong. I don't mind having a Supreme Court. In fact, we need a Supreme Court to ha be the top... <laughs> Court of Appeals in the judicial system. Yes. I just don't think they should be a legislature. And the power of judicial review, the right of to them to, 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 make citizens united to enact laws system. and, and to rule acts of the legislature or the executive branch unconstitutional is not part of our Constitution. It was stolen by Marbury uh, in, in a case called Marbury versus Madison in 1803. The Supreme Court says, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to tell the Congress they can't do that. Put a stick on their shoulder and dare people to knock it off. And they said, oh, okay. Okay, now, so you're currently working on Simply Smart Travel. You're, you're segueing out of your past political career and into this travel thing. Yeah, but I'm still me, and I'm still a political scientist. Absolutely. And so writing there's about politics in this, too. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, not partisan politics, but in writing about a destination. It's history, it's culture, it's government, it's ideas uh, are very important to me, and I tend to look at that when I travel someplace. And is it safe? And emphasize, yeah. There's certain countries right now that it wouldn't yeah. be safe to well, travel Some of to. my travel is international. Some of it is as close as I... Uh, Thank, um, let me put, give everybody your different websites where they can find you to do the Simply Travel, Simply Smart Travel, which would be at www simplysmarttravel.com they can buy your book on Amazon, actually you've got uh, an author page there with seven of your books, your political books you also are available for Fixing American Government at fixingamericangovernment.com right, you can buy the book through there too right from the website, now do you get more money if they buy it right from your website, a bigger piece of the pie yeah but I don't make money okay. I didn't the book's only six dollars as a as an ebook and ten bucks as a as a paperback. That's I didn't write this to make reasonable. money. I wrote this to make a splash. <laughs> and it's very reasonable. Let's hope it does make a splash and make a little bit of a difference if we start taking baby steps towards fixing things. That well, we you can break. go to Village Voices and buy it too. That's true. It is available at Village Voices. Thank you very much for being on Culture Coast. It was a pleasure having you. My pleasure. Village of the Arts, the largest artist colony in the state of Florida, located on 42 acres, includes artists, homes, galleries, gardens, and restaurants featuring handcrafted gifts, fine art sculptures, painting, photography, enviro art, healing arts, books, mystics, and musical variety. A few of the galleries are unique in their offerings. Village Voices specializes in books and art created exclusively by Florida residents. The Dancing Crane Gallery offers fine art, custom jewelry, and unique innovative art. The Village Mystic offers all things metaphysical, meditation, massage, mediums, aromatherapy, psychic, shamans, reiki healing, and the gem mine where you can mine for your own personal treasure. Yoga Arts offers classes or one-on-one -on -one coaching. Musicians and bands can be found throughout the area. Many of the artists and musicians offer classes. 
Restaurants and bakeries provide respite for the weary and magic for the foodies. Visit during the first Art Friday Art Walk and stroll through the shops and galleries enjoying free appetizers, wine, music, and demonstrations. For hours and information, please visit the website at www.villageofthearts.com.